So as way to go, Bill. Creepy boy. I guess it's we really miss her around the lab. <laughs> well, I guess uh ten oh one, so good a time as any to start. Um so I'm Zachary Page. Uh, I work for um, uh, White Earth Food Sovereignty Initiative up here in Manoman. Uh, we're up to a few things this year. We've got the White Earth Mobile Market grocery store that's up and running. And the uh, cover crop project with the uh, U of M uh, Grossman Lab that's here, who's here today. And we're really excited to share uh, what's going on in Manoman. There'll be an opportunity for a field day, July 6th, and Naomi will get into that. Um, but we just kind of wanted to talk about, we didn't know exactly what the situation would be like because of COVID um, this summer. So this is kind of like our spring field day uh, to, to kick off because we didn't know when we we're planning which way things would go and I guess we still don't know exactly, but right now we could plan for a, an outdoor um, Xerxes training on July 6th, but, um, but this is kind of like the overview um, and we'll record it. So if you need to, or want to look back on it later about what's, uh, what's happening here, uh, I could do that. Um, I'll put it out to YouTube. And then if anybody wants to, uh, get that copy, maybe just leave your email in the chat and then I know I could send it to you. But I was gonna start out with a, a few soil health slides uh, from, I did a presentation and worked on one uh, called uh, Soil Health for Specialty Crop, crop Fruit and Vegetable Growers uh, uh, a year or two ago. And that kind of integrated these soil health principles into, uh, like everyday farmer applications. So just showing a few pictures on how to apply these principles. And then I'll just do that for cover crops and then we'll get on to uh, this uh, collaborate, this exciting collaboration. So let me share a screen. All right. How do I, slideshow. So, um, Working with SFA is a great organization. Uh, you can become a member. It's like forty dollars. Get discounts off the um, off the comp for the annual conference, which is a a great conference to meet people. There's chapters. We're in the uh, Lake Agassiz area up here, and I see Amy's here from the chapter. Um, and we meet monthly and have. We're gonna have some cool events later on in the summer. Um, we're going to have like a harvest event down near Pelican Rapids area uh, with music and uh, gathering and education. So it's a good farmer to farmer network to check out. So I'd, I'd check it out. They've got a really great interactive website. And then if you go to Soil Health on the website, uh, they have a good section on resources. And there's actually a, a really great four page PDF of this and uh, the bullet points of this presentation here. So check that out as well. So getting right to it, uh, soil health principles. These are the five principles. Um, they're not, they're less rules um, and they're more principles that you could apply to your situation. So you have your own resources, you've got your own uh, situation at your own farm. Uh, the best answer to uh, most questions is it depends on your farm, your operation, um, because it depends on your situation, depends on your soil texture, it depends on your slopes and what livestock you might have or what trees um, and what kind of fertility you have. So these are just like the basics, uh, keeping the soil covered, minimizing soil disturbance, increase crop diversity, keep living roots in the soil and integrating livestock when you can. And we're gonna just concentrate on that first 
principal because this is the cover crop and I guess uh, principle number three too, crop diversity. Um, but we've got the other presentation on this um, going over all these uh, principles and other workshops as well. So just some um, kind of indicators of soil health, good soil health, high microbial activity. You could do a soil smell test um, and like a, a good healthy smell. Uh, soil that smells good is usually an indicator of high microbial activity. There is something uh, called PLFA test or PF, PFLA. I get, Adria could maybe follow up with that. Uh, Phospholipid fatty acid. Also, David has a question, I think. Oh, yeah, David. Um, yeah, could you also cover um, how to terminate covered crops without, without herbicides? Yeah. Yeah, because we're, we're organic over here. We're going for organic certification. And, and I don't even, I don't think we can use any kind of um, um, herbicide um, termination like they do, you know, like they use the Roundup and stuff. So I, yeah, I definitely. Advice. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for the, yeah. Here. I'll integrate that into all the, um, all the examples we have as much as I can. And then we could also kind of keep that in our mind as we're talking about all the cover crops here that we're, we're up to with the project. Um, so yeah, ability to infiltrate water and store water. So what that is, is basically the, the glomules or the glues of the, the good microbial activity creates a home uh, well, or the, the good pores or what you call uh, so humus and high in organic, organic matter, that's all good. And that's basically creating this home for, for the microbes and um, a good soil holds water. So you don't want to have uh, soil that things are eroding through um, and things are passing through your soil. You want the soil to be able to hold nutrients. And uh, the best indicator of that is high microbial activity. So you're feeding your microbes. Um, let's see. So yeah, these are the three big soil components, biological, chemical, physical. A lot of times we spend a little bit too much energy on the chemical side of things, especially in big ag. Uh, the answer is uh, with big ag, it's always you know spray, um, spray fertilizers on it. And these are these chemical inputs, but the one that's forgotten and the most, arguably, um, I personally think the most important one to to kind of keep in your mind is this biological um, and the relationships between the microorganisms and the roots and how nutrients are actually transferred with the symbi symbiotic relationship. 85 to 90% of your soil function is mediated by microbial activity. So it's not to be understated that this is a, a very important factor in uh, soil health. So feeding your fungi, feeding your living roots, this kind of goes, now we're kind of getting closer to cover crops and we'll get closer and closer to what we're up to uh, this summer with the project. So keeping a living root in the soil is important. Um, you don't want bare ground for a number of reasons and that kind of goes into other uh, reasons as well as uh, you don't want to have your soil temperature too high in the, in the summer um, and, and kind of cook your soil. Uh, living roots in the ground also indicates that you've got something above the ground so your, your soils could retain more water um, and having more plant diversity as well. We'll get into that. Uh, just quickly, so, some um, examples of soil disturbance, physical, biological, chemical, physical. If you're over tilling, um, that could uh, indicate, uh, that could uh, destroy your, your networks and I guess one example is if a tornado comes to your town, maybe once a year or once every 10 years, you're going to say, okay, um, we have to rebuild. But say it comes, a tornado comes to your town every day, then you're going to say, well, maybe we should pick up and move. So all the uh, beneficial microbes, uh, you, we want to keep them from being uh, disturbed too much. And you want to, if you are tilling, you want to 
um, be be aware of not over tilling. Uh, why is soil organic matter important? It's Zach, what's over tilling? <laughs> over tilling is tilling over and over and over and over again, where you start to see and uh, use your observational skills, right? Like use your right. You use your eyes and your hands and, and feel the soil if there's clods, if there's big clods um, of soil because it rips through that structure and then um, then you can't have a good seed bed. And also the other indicator is like if your soil is so compact that you can't even break through it. Um, these are some indicators that you're over tilling um, your soil. So it, it you could see it visually in different ways with different soil textures. So if your soil is pretty sandy, you might not get those clods. Um, but if it's really clay, it uh, has a lot of clay in it, then you might be getting these big chunks. So depending on what your soil type is like, uh, it might show up in different ways, if that makes sense. And then sometimes another thing to look out for is if you're tilling and the wind's blowing a little bit and you're getting like big dust clouds go through, um, that's another indicator that your soil is leaving your farm. And we saw that last week here when there was 40 mile an hour winds in Minoman, there was massive dust clouds. And that means that there's generally overtilling in this whole area because there's so much wind erosion uh, blowing or blowing the soil away. Um, you could do tests, water infiltration tests. Um, and there's some more resources on that on the SFA uh, pages. And going back to soil health principles now, <clears throat> looking at soil, keeping the soil health covered, soil covered. Um, and so principle one and three is what we're up to today, See, keeping the soil covered and crop diversity. And I, I suppose four as well, if we're keeping a living root in the soil over the winter or as much as we can. So some strategies from Minnesota farms, we'll see on soil on cover crops in particular, uh, keeping the soil covered. These are some other ways to keep soil covered, mulching or tarping, but we're talking about cover crops today. Um, so this was on the solar fresh farm. These are examples of real farms that are in Minnesota. Uh, they're a organic CSA near the cities. And um, what Sarah does is she broadcasts oats and winter rye and wheat in one of her spots. And you can see that to the left. And then to the right, uh, she's just got the simple tools, right? She's got a scythe you know, from the 1800s cutting down. So that's a termination. Um, there are other ways to terminate, which we could, we'll get into, um, but just cutting it down uh, before a seed, seed head emerges, if that's your plan. Um, looking at your cover crops with crop diversity, some things that might come up are beneficial cover crops to eat, such as purslane and lamb's quarter. So on the left there and the bottom right of that picture is a lamb's quarter, wild spinach. And then on the left hand picture, um, the succulent type looking plant is a purslane that's got a nice lemony flavor. So know your weedy, eat your weedies. Um, they are very high in nutrients. So it's a good education and it could be fun at a farmer's market and throw in CSA box, maybe another thing to talk about with, uh, with people. Other ways of cover cropping, like in between your rows here. So this is Josh from the Henderson farm and he's got a really nice uh, vetch cover crop with his dog there. So that's how high he got it. And then he just disked it in, planted winter squash right into that and best crop ever. So uh, legumes or vetch uh, can fix nitrogen. So that would be a good one to choose if you're planting something like winter squash that might need that. And going in between the rows here with Brussels sprouts, um, maybe to keep the grass out. So he's doing hairy vetch and annual rye mix. And then another perspective is that from uh, Kathy Connell of Redford Gardens, she says um, she's got really depleted soil um, down in Sabika area. 
And for her, red, cl red clover is the best for soil building. It's just another uh, nitrogen fixer. And she worked on her soil for about 10 years and got a, a lot more organic matter on there from sandy soil. You can see how sandy it might be there with all the pine trees. Um, she got over time um, growing red clover built up her soil organic matter. Then we got uh, Blue Fruit Farm. I'm not sure that they're still in this area, but they are, this is Jim Riddle, who's like one of the top organic guys in the country. And he would, uh, he would grow buckwheat in between uh, the rows, which is another good uh, builder of uh, organic matter. Works really well in our area. And we'll end it here with a multi-species cover crop blend. Uh, this is uh, Jim Chamberlain, as uh, Dave was mentioning, uh, Happy Dancing Turtle, and they do a multi-cover crop blend. So that was, I think that was the third principle of keeping diversity. Um, diversity above the ground is also kind of reflective of diversity under the ground. So you're feeding different kinds of uh, microbes, not just the same and it's important to um, keep diversity for disease, pressure, and it also kind of reflects our ecology of our natural systems. So if you're walking to a forest, it's not just one crop, it never is. It's never just one uh, oak tree or something, or it's always a diversity, there's always an understory and there's always a lot of diversity. So we're mimicking nature and um, kind of, keeps that resiliency also in your farming operation when you're rotating and you're using different kinds of uh, species when you're farming as well as cover cropping. So, so with that, um, we'll do, we could do questions all the way at the end. Uh, I think that would be good or we could throw them into the chat so we don't forget as well. But um, I'm gonna pass it over to Adria with, um, and then, she could start talking about what we're up to this summer with our cover crop project. So thanks for listening to our the first uh, soil health uh, overview. And yeah, that's the Adria here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Zach. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, So um, I'm Adria, I'm a researcher in uh, Julie Grossman's lab in the Department of Horticulture at the, um, at the University of Minnesota. And I'm the coordinator of the Summer Cover Crop Project. Um, and so the project that we're working on, um, the Summer Cover Crop Project is a collaborative uh, project um, between our lab, as well as um, the White Earth Nation who like we're really, excited to um, and privileged to get to work with with you and like really excited to finally get to come up and see the site this year because last year that wasn't possible so we just did our first planting and uh, it was super fun. Um, and then we're also working with uh, Big River Farms which is an incubator farm um, incubator and educational farm uh, focusing on uh, immigrant and underrepresented farmers um, the Xerces Society is also a collaborator on this. They're an organization uh, that focuses on uh, insect and arthropod conservation. Um, and we have some help from Extension too. And then the project is funded by a couple of grants, one from NRCS and one from SARE. Um, so the goal of the Summer Cover Crops Project is to help vegetable farmers select and manage summer cover crops um, to provide multiple benefits on their farms. Um, and when we talk about cover crops, of course, we don't, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean a particular species. Anything can be a cover crop, but we, it, it's a cover crop if instead of harvesting it off to feed to people or to livestock, we're leaving that crop in place and incorporating it into the soil to basically feed it to the soil. Um, and so cover crops are a tool that we can use to, to um, reduce some of the stresses that tilled agriculture places on the land. And Zach talked about some of those. So anytime, you know, anytime you're taking nutrients off in harvested crops, 
um, you're removing those nutrients, particularly nitrogen from the land. And so um, in order to sustain that system, nutrients have to be added and they have to be conserved. We're working in organic systems. Um, so we're not looking at how to add um, synthetic nitrogen. So cover crops, when you plant, for example, a cover crop in the legume family, legumes um, have this partnership with soil bacteria where they can draw in uh, nitrogen from the air, from the atmosphere and fix it in their, in their biomass um, to become available to other, cro other crops later. Um, Non-legume cover crops aren't going to fix nitrogen, but they can take it up when it's vulnerable to loss and then release it later. Um, another stress that tillage, Zach was talking about some of the stresses of tillage, it can really place a strain on the physical structure of the soil. There can be a lot of bare soil time um, and uh, the soil can be vulnerable to, to erosion from wind and water. So cover crops keep it, you know, they keep just a physical cover on the on the soil to protect it from wind and rock, water erosion, keep roots in the soil to keep that structure stabilized. And the organic matter that the cover crops put in, it acts as a sponge to retain water and, and keep the soil workable. Um, the other thing that cover crops can do is often cropping systems are, are limited in their species diversity. And so cover crops are an opportunity to get more species on the land and particularly to add flowers to the landscape at times when um, when farming, farm landscapes can be kind of short on flowers. Um, so often when you hear about cover crop research, you hear about working on trying to slot um, a winter cover into a corn and soybean rotation, um, which is tricky, but, um, but vegetable cropping systems actually offer a lot of, uh, a lot of an ex more opportunity for cover crops because you have different uh, different crops with different growing periods. So that gives you different slots that you can place cover crops in in the rotation. Um, and so our project is looking at cover crops that can be used in a couple of different timings. One is um, right after a short season spring crop like lettuce. Um, and the other is before a shorter season fall crop. Like broccoli. Um, and so in this project, we're looking at six different um, either species or species mixes of cover crops. Um, and we're comparing the way they act in these farming systems with a couple of controls. One is comparing them with what happens if we just leave the ground weedy, um, which like Zach said, the weeds can have some benefits of their own sometimes. And what happens if you just leave the ground bare? And so there's four things that we're collecting data on about the performance of these cover crops. One is basically just how they do. You know, do they make a nice thick stand that grows well? Do they exclude weeds? Do they produce a lot of biomass? Um, then we, we're looking at their nutrient contributions in the system. And Maddie is going to talk after me about those. Um, we're looking at their flowering, whether they flower in these time slots and attract pollinators and beneficial insects, which Naomi's going to talk about. And then we're looking at how they um, contribute to the soil microbes that are really the key to what the life of the soil and the turnover of materials in the soil. And Gabby's going to talk about those. Um, so the crops that we're looking at um, are first a, a field pea and an oat mix. So field pea is a legume, it's a really strong nitrogen fixer. Often people like to mix a legume with a grass. So field pea and oat is sort of a cool season mix that grows well in cool weather and adding the grass helps the legume fill that stand and exclude, exclude weeds. It gives the legume something to climb on. Um, so it's good for that. So that's our cool season grass legume mix. We're also looking at a warm season grass legume mix of cowpea and sorghum sedan grass. So that can take advantage of hot weather to um, really put on a lot of growth really fast. Um, we're looking at crimson clover, which is another legume. It's a strong nitrogen fixer um, and it also flowers really nicely. Um, and then we're looking at three other uh, cover crops that are not legumes. Um, so buckwheat, nice thing about buckwheat is that um, it comes in and grows and goes through its whole life cycle really fast. So it's really flexible as to where you can fit it into the season. Um, it's also, you know, it flowers a lot. Um, Phasalia, which is a less familiar one to me. I'd never worked with it before. It's native to the US Southwest and it also grows this really nice thick stand with really abundant flowers. Um, 
And Sunflower, which was a suggestion of, um, of the folks at of Zach and also the folks at Big River to add to the um, to add to our lineup here. Um, also a really nice pollinator attractive plant and grows really big. Um, so what we're doing at these sites, the, the way this experiment is is laid out is basically we're we're trying out these six cover crops and the control treatments. Um, in, in these two different timings. So we go in in the spring and we plant half the field to lettuce um, and the other half to the plots of cover crops. Um, and then around the middle of the season, each of those turns over. Um, and so the plots that were in cover crops, um, we mow them off and till them in. Um, so those, yeah, we just, we terminate them by mowing. We don't uh, use any herbicide in there. And then the lettuce is harvested off. And so then after the cover crops are tilled in, we, we plant that side of the field to broccoli. And we see how the broccoli performs after those cover crops. And then the, uh, we harvest off the lettuce and we plant that side of the field to cover crops. Um, so one of the things that people have sometimes asked about this experiment is why we're looking at you know, these relatively simple mixes or single species. Um, and why we're not moving further towards um, like the full diversity that you'd see in a natural system. Um, and basically the short answer is that uh, diversity is really complex. Anytime you have a diverse system, you have a complex system. And so people often buy a really complex mixture of cover crop seed and find that it doesn't do what they were hoping it might do. Um, either one species will sort of dominate or the weeds will dominate the whole thing um, because Basically using, there's not really a one size, size fits all solution to developing complex cover crop practices. Um, you really have to know the plants that you're using and then also really under, really know the land that you're working on. So this project is helping us get to know these plants and their capabilities so that, so that farmers can use those to, you know, to mix and tinker using their knowledge of their own land. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say before I turn it over to Maddie here is that um, is that there's going to be opportunities to visit the site at Monoman, um, and I know Naomi's going to talk a little bit about the pollinator training, and I I think that Zach and Adam may also be planning some visit days. We're going to have some uh, signs up introducing the cover crops so that you can kind of take a self guided tour. So we'll we'll keep people posted on on plans for that, and I will turn it over to Maddie to talk about. Uh, Thank you. Um, I will also just share my screen. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Uh, one Thanks. real quick comment um, to Adria. Um, there's a, a a mix down in a Albert Lee Seed House that that has that cool uh, mix. It's called Nitro Max. It's got the oats, the POPs, and also uh, Daikon radish. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, the radish, the radish can be a real nice addition because it puts down like a really deep taproot sort of biological tillage almost. Yeah. All right, I'm back on mute. Thank you for that. I think daikon radishes are very underrated, so I appreciate them being added to this conversation. <laughs> um, but hello, everyone. I am Maddie. I'm a second year PhD student in the Grossman lab, and I'm super interested in the nitrogen side of things on this project. So that's most of what I'm going to be talking to you guys about. Um, so like Adria said, all of these things that we're getting from these cover crops, all of these really great benefits, um, we tend to call those ecosystem services. Um, these really great kind of human centric benefits that we're getting from these things. Um, and cover crops are a really great way to get a lot of those at one time. Um, but I want to really highlight that um, these cover crops can only provide so many at a time. Um, so we find I've been trying to come up with a really good analogy for this. Um, so I'm open to feedback on this, but I've been thinking about these ecosystem services from cover crops kind of like ice cream toppings. Um, so you can have things like nitrogen retention and weed suppression and biomass production. And maybe those are like your chocolatey toppings that you use to make a hot fudge sundae and they go really well together. But then you have other services like nitrogen supply and pest suppression and primary crop yield here 
that are maybe more like fruity or gummy. Uh, maybe you use those for like a banana split. <laughs> um, so you have kind of these ones that go really well together, but all of them don't go really well together, even though they're all really good. Um, so we can kind of only get a certain amount at a time um, to a really full extent. And that makes it really important, like we've been talking about, to choose the right cover crops for your goals on your land. Um, and that's something that we really want to narrow down in this project. Um, and we're particularly interested in this one kind of trade-off. Um, and that is this potential trade-off between the nitrogen services that I want to look at, that I'll talk to you more about in a second, and um, some of these flowering services that provide habitat for beneficial insects that Naomi will cover in a minute as well. Um, so we don't know much about flowering services in our cover crops, um, mostly because summer cover crops are kind of this new thing and they are um, really where we're getting a lot of these flowering services, but we've been so focused on winter cover crops for so long um, that we don't know much about how these things are interacting in um, these flowering systems. So um, here you can see this whole uh, life cycle of a flowering plant similar to a flowering cover crop where we have seed, germination, growth, and then we have this flowering stage where we have pollination and a seed formation and return to seed. Um, pretty standard life cycle. And here is where we really want to achieve our flowering services. Um, but we have to be careful because as flowering proceeds and seeds start to form, um, we get some of that nitrogen from our soft tissues and our cover crops that we're trying to recycle and recover um, and that gets thrown into our seeds for nutrient storage in those seeds. Um, so we're having this nitrogen move from this soft decomposable tissue where it can be recovered and then used in our kind of primary crops to supply those with nutrient. And that's moving into this kind of hard seed that might be harder to decompose. Um, so we're not really sure if that movement of nitrogen from our soft tissues to our seeds is eventually going to make less nitrogen available to our primary crops that are following our cash crops. Um, so we basically want to make sure that there's not a trade-off between having these really great flowering services um, that provide all this great habitat for our beneficial insects and getting the nitrogen supply that we need on our fields. Um, so that's the main kind of trade-off that we're looking at in this study. Um, but I am, of course, focused on the nitrogen side of things. Um, so I'm super interested in how cover crops are working with nitrogen um, because cover crops can really optimize nitrogen delivery um, to our main crops. So um, we know that our main crops have kind of a changing demand for nitrogen throughout the season. Um, they have kind of this line where um, this is how much nitrogen they need at any point. Um, and our cover crops are kind of a cool way to meet that demand because they can take up excess nitrogen from the soil and even add nitrogen to the soil at periods when that nitrogen would normally be vulnerable to loss. Um, and then they take that nitrogen up into their tissues and then they recycle it and release it to our primary crops um, exactly when they need it. So in this way, we're both meeting that crop demand for nitrogen, um, but we're also avoiding these losses that can be really harmful to ecosystems. Um, the loss that I have been studying most um, in this study is nitrate leaching losses, um, and those can pollute our waterways um, and also contribute to really detrimental impacts on aquatic ecosystems. So that's something we want to avoid um, and cover crops can help us do that. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything here. So basically our cover crops are an extraordinary kind of practice that we can use to really mimic um, nutrient cycling in an agricultural system, mimic natural nutrient cycling. So um, to kind of narrow in on how nitrogen is moving through these different cover crop systems that we're studying that Adria introduced, um, I'm measuring nitrogen in a couple different ways. Um, so first we are tracking nitrogen in each of these cover crop systems um, and the, the primary crops that either proceed or follow them. 
um, by taking soils monthly. Um, so every month we go out and we collect our soil. Um, we then try to get the nitrogen out of that soil. <laughs> um, so we do that by just basically shaking it in a salt solution. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to get too far into that, but I did want to show you uh, this. plate um, and do this analysis where we add a chemical compound that reacts with nitrogen to form this colored compound. Um, so we can see here that there are some of these wells in this plate that are darker than others. Um, and that tells us that there's more nitrogen. Um, so as, as the color gets darker, we, we know that there was more nitrogen in that sample. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, a machine that reads the color of that sample and tells us how much nitrogen was in there. Um, but I think that that's a really cool way that we use to kind of see all at once a bunch of different samples, how much nitrogen um, were in, was in each of those samples. Um, so that's just some behind the scenes lab work that we're doing to see how nitrogen is being taken up um, and then subsequently released in these systems. And then we're also measuring the nitrogen content of our plants, um, of our cover crops. So we collect some of the cover crop biomass when we terminate our cover crops. And then we analyze it for what we call tissue quality, um, which is really just uh, the amount of nitrogen relative to carbon in the plant. Um, and that can tell us basically how quickly or slowly nitrogen will be released from that cover crop tissue as our primary crop is growing and um, needing that nitrogen. So we need to know how quickly that's going to be released. And then finally, we're measuring those nitrogen losses, particularly nitrate leaching, um, using these really fancy ion exchange resin lysimeters. <laughs> um, these are a hot topic. Um, they are literally just wedding favor bags <laughs> that we put these really highly specialized plastic bat beads in, these really, really tiny beads. Um, these beads are usually used in water filtration systems, um, but we just put them in these wedding favor bags and we bury them at the beginning of the season um, when we plant things. We bury them below the root zone um, and then as water runs through them, kind of out of the, our cover cropping systems, it collects any nitrate that runs through. Um, and then we dig them back up at the end of the season and we analyze them in the same way that we analyze our soils for the amount of nitrogen on those beads. Um, and that tells us how much nitrate could have potentially left our system. Um, so that can let us know how well our cover crops are kind of diverting those nitrogen losses that we want to avoid. Um, so that's a pretty cool method. I don't know, everyone is always super interested in that, but it's really quite simple. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoy that one too. Um, and basically just some takeaways from this. Cover crops, as I said, can aid in nitrogen supply while avoiding losses by kind of mimicking that natural nutrient cycling. Um, but we still need more information on how different summer cover crops can uh, deliver these nitrogen services um, so that farmers and growers um, can, as Adri Adria said, I love the word tinker for this, <laughs> um, tinker with cover crops to meet their goals on their land. Um, and then finally, I just want to point you guys, you all to a, a couple really good resources that are freely available to you. So one of them is the University of Minnesota Extension for Small Farms. Um, their YouTube site has a, a video where you can learn how to estimate nitrogen um, content of your cover crops and how much uh, nitrogen you'll get from those cover crops for your primary crops. Um, and they have a bunch of other really cool videos. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. And then there's also this freely available publication from SARE um, that basically is a 101 on cover crops and everything about them and how to use them. Um, and that is on their website online. So um, totally free. And yes, please use those. And that is all I have. Um, so I will next turn it over to Naomi, who will talk to you about flowering and insects.
Hello there. Um, good morning. My name is Naomi Candelaria Morales. I am a second year master's student in the Grossman Lab. Um, my work is focused on the diversity and the composition of insect communities supported by the cover crop treatments under observation. So important to explain what is considered a beneficial insect. Um, how, do the, how do this differ from what we call pest? Well, it definitely has to do with who is viewing a particular situation and what is at stake. For example, if you are a vegetable farmer and an insect is feeding on those crops, most probably it will be considered a pest because of a negative uh, economic uh, impact that is induced. However, if you are a cattle farmer uh, and there is a specific type of weed you're trying to control for, incorporating a herbivorous insect which spe specializes in eating plants and which are usually categorized as pests, in this scenario would be considered a beneficial insect because uh, in the end, the farmer is receiving some sort of benefit from this interaction. So like Maddie said, many of these cat categories are human centric. So um, in an agronomic sense, beneficial insects refer to any species that contributes to the conservation, the protection, or the enhancement of an agronomic crop and farming system. So just a real quick um, guide through and entomology, uh, these life stages refer to different growth stages an insect may experience. So taking into consideration that depending on the type of insect, these may look somewhat different. In the case of insects with gradual metamorphosis, the life stages are mainly composed of an egg, an, a nymph, and an adult stage, with the nymph closely resembling the adult uh, eating and behavioral patterns. So usually you're going to see them eating and being in the same place, versus an insect that goes through a complete metamorphosis, which experience an egg, a larvae, pupa <clears throat> and adult stage. And in many cases, these tend to ca characterize the insect with a particular eating uh, behavioral, behavioral patterns depending on which life stage um, the insect is. So beneficial insects provide an array of services um, and are many times categorized or put in a box by a specific service. So like, for example, pollination, uh, predation, parasitiza uh, parasitization, decomposition among many different types of services. However, many of these insects can provide multiple services depending on the situation and life stage of the insect. So for example, there are many types of pollinators, not just bees, although these are definitely better pollinators for uh, a greater diversity of agricultural crops. Another um, important pollinator that provides multiple services depending on their life stage are hoverflies. One, um, and then these are mi big bee mimicries and in their larvae stage, they are predators. However, um, in their adult stage, hoverflies um, also are pollinators and they specialize in plants that compose small white flowers. So buckwheat, one of our uh, cover crops are of interest. And another important beneficial insect we are currently monitoring, mon monitoring are parasitoids. Parasitoid insects specialize in obviously parasitizing other insect hosts in order to develop into their final adult life stage. Um, and these can be either endo or exoparasitoids, which mean that they live inside or outside their host. But what differentiates a parasitoid from a parasite is that parasitoids kill their host upon reaching adult stage and exiting their host cavity. 
versus a parasite, which need their host to be alive in order to keep surviving. And obviously there's always exceptions, but this is the, the common. Um, so this project is focused on evaluating the viability of summer cover crops as insect trees in organic rotation systems of the upper Midwest. This evaluation will compare and contrast an early versus the late summer cover crop planting, compare summer cover crop species and flowering times for the maximum flowering benefits, and assess capacity of summer cover crops to attract beneficial insect populations. We have two sampling methods, a destructive and an observational sampling. Destructive sampling is performed with a specialized insect vacuum, which is illustrated in the picture on the left. Arthropod species then are collected and are categorized as beneficial or non-beneficial, and then these organisms are pinned for future reference. Now um, I'll go into some results that we have from last summer. Um, from flowering monitoring, uh, we saw that buckwheat had similar growth patterns in both locations and both planting times. Phacelia had a greater performance in their early planting time versus the late while field peas and crimson clover did gener generally very poorly in their production of flowers. Um, and it was basically due to some time constrictions. And some flower perform better in the late planting versus the early, just because it takes a while for them to flower, around 76 days. Here in this table, um, we are observing a total um, we're observing a uh, total and percent of insects collected by treatment and planting time. So here, let me see if I get my mouse running. Um, on the left, we see taxonomical identification levels. So we see like family, genus, species with the total values. And then the family is subdivided into functional groups. Um, so either beneficial, pest, or neutral, and neutral just because, like I mentioned, uh, insects can provide different types of services, and it's sometimes hard to put them like in a box of like, is it good, is it bad? It's depending on what they're doing and what they're interacting with. So some may be categorized as just neutral. And so the boxes that are there highlighted are just to guide your view into um, uh, which functional groups were the most dominant in each treatment and planting time. So in the first column, we see that buckwheat was variable between planting times with greater beneficials in the late planting. Crimson clover and field peas were mostly pests. Uh, Phacelia was consistently more attractive to beneficial communities, as well as sunflower and weeds consistently attracted more pests. Um, this graph is showing us amount of bees per treatment and planting time. And on the, on the y-axis, which is here, um, we're seeing a mean of bees. And on the x-axis, we see the treatments of the covered crops. And here we are observing four different bee genuses, um, which are commonly known as honeybees, bumblebees, and sweat bees. Um, we see differences among the treatments and the planting time points with, uh, in the early planting, uh, we see that Phacelia, uh, this bar really tall here, uh, had the greatest amount and diversity However, in the late planting time, we see that buckwheat had similar amounts as Phacelia, and we also see that diversity decreased overall. Um, here we are observing amount of surfeits per treatment and planting time. And as mentioned before, the surfeits uh, known as hoverflies, their bee mimicries, their pollinators in the adult, their um, predators in their larvae stage. Uh, again, y-axis is the mean of the surfeits and the x-axis is the treatments. And we are observing values for species level identification. 
so different species of surfeits. And although there were no differences between treatments or planting times, there may be potentially uh, diversity differences between the early and the late planting time points. Um, here we are seeing amount of lady beetles per treatment and the same Y is showing mean, X is showing the treatments, um, ID is also to species level. And again, there are no differences among treatments and planting times, but we, we may see some differences in diversity among the early and the late planting time. Um, there is a lot more to look at, but this is some of the preliminary data that we evaluated to this point. So main takeaways are that summer cover crops increase diversity in organic systems and provide ecosystem services, including beneficial insects. Beneficial insects, uh, insect research can supply extensive understanding of the value and ecologically imperative use of summer cover crops. And insects may be viewed as beneficial depending on their functionality in a system and what life stage is carried out. Um, also, I wanted to mention, like Zach uh, was talking about, next July 6th, that I think it's a Tuesday, from 9 to around probably 2 p.m will be uh, where our cover crop plots are in Monoman um, at White Earth. We'll be um, uh, having a workshop for insect identification. Um, it's a great opportunity to really uh, see what, what is out in, in our surroundings, uh, see how many beneficial insects uh, are actually there. A lot of times we think that it might be a pest because it looks like a, like a little worm, but like we learned, some some worms, uh, some larvae may be actually providing some some cool services. So, a good way to to learn that uh, that will be in collaboration with the Circe's Foundation. Sarah Foltz will be um, leading that that workshop. And if you are interested, uh, just please email uh, Sack, and he will definitely provide you with more detail and information for that that activity. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I come next. So I'm also part of the Grossman team. I joined the lab last year. And um, really my part of, the, of, of my research is to complement everything that has been already mentioned about cover crops and looking into the microbiome. So the microorganisms that are interacting with our cover crops in the soil during the decomposition period after we terminate the cover crops. Um, so I just want to reiterate or put a emphasis again on this idea of thinking about the agroecosystems as this union of different parts um, based on soil and agroecosystem health. So I just uh, drew this definition about soil health as this continued capacity of soil to function as a vital a living system within ecosystems and land use boundaries uh, so that it allows us to sustain biological productivity, maintain the quality of air and water environment, and promote plant, animal, and human health. So that's the way we envision this project, and that's why each one of us is trying to draw some connections and some dots between the nutri nutritional status in the soil, uh, the insects part, the biomass part, and my part, which is the microorganisms. Uh, so as you may have heard, or you know, uh, if we look underground, if we look uh, beneath what we have um, above the surface uh, of, of the soil, uh, we have this myriad of organisms that are interacting among themselves, that are interacting with the soil solutions or so the different components that are uh, floating around in the soil solution and also with the plants. Uh, we have bacteria, we have uh, fungi, viruses, um, protozoa, we have different groups. 
And as Naomi mentioned, uh, from our anthropocentric view, we also tend to classify them as some being beneficial and other being pathogenic if they cause uh, damage to the plant tissue. But really uh, looking as an ecosystem, um, we need every, everything. Uh, everything has to be under some kind of balance of equilibrium. So it's a as I said, complements to the information that we've already been able to get a little bit of more understanding. Um, this uh, photo in the middle of the slide is just a view under the microscope. So to get more knowledge about the techniques that I'm going to be using this first year after I do my first sampling in the soil, um, I'm getting to know more of the techniques. So I'm actually taking one class right now in the Itasca Biological Station um, to learn more about these techniques. So if we look just under the microscope, we would find something similar to this picture. So that long strain there is probably a root hair. I thought it may be maybe a nematode, but it wasn't moving. So I think it was just a root hair. And then all the dots that we see there are probably bacteria, um, spores, just some droplets of water, uh, salts uh, coming from the soil. So that's part of the soil solution that I was talking about. So again, why is it important to look at the microbiome in the soil? Um, as Zach mentioned, uh, the way that we live right now, the way we see our world is driven by microbial interactions and the functions that they provide in our ecosystem. Uh, in the soil and as part of the agroecosystem, they perform mineralization of nutrients, nitrogen fixation, nutrient acquisition, and also they help in the suppression of plant pathogens. Um, we could probably, well, I don't know about that, but we could probably go on without microbes in our world, but we would be super prone to diseases. Um, we would really lack a very, very important and strong part of um, our health. So my main uh, question here, at least for this first uh, stage of the research is to what extent to cover crop biomass affect microbial structure and function. So I'm gonna be looking at the communities when we terminate the cover crops. And during that decomposition uh, process, how this biomass that we are integrated into the soil, how that has an effect on the microbial communities that are uh, uh, living and developing underneath the main crop that is growing in that period. And from there, from that understanding, we're gonna also be able to help in this formulation of sustainable management decisions. So how we can manage these trade-offs between nitrogen provision, a pollinator habitat, and also microbial growth, which are the communities that are being benefited from a, a certain species of cover crops. And we could also like later think about how combining them so we can have multiple benefits from these microbial communities, thinking about fungi, thinking about different groups of bacteria. As I mentioned, those groups that help to mineralize nutrients or uh, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, so this is just a scheme of what my sampling time points are looking for this season. Um, we already planted the cover crops um, and we are going to see them as they grow for six to eight weeks. And then we would mow them and integrate that plant biomass into the first layer of the soil. And then I'm gonna be taking my samples. So I'm considering um, taking samples from the bulk soil uh, to 10 centimeters in depth and also from the rhizosphere, which is this soil that is covering the root system to get a better sense of how the microbial communities are developing around the root. Um, and yeah, my, my time points during the decomposition process. So for this, I'm gonna be using uh, different approaches. So the soil sampling will allow me to extract uh, some of the DNA. Uh, those are some of the techniques that I'm learning right now to know about that um, DNA sequence that microbes present and being able to ident identify them 
from that uh, genetic sequence, because from the, just from the microscope, it's not possible to know which groups are living there. That's something that their information at a molecular scale allows us to do nowadays. And that's just another diagram of how complex diversity is in the soil. This is looking at a surface around a, um, a root here, um, how uh, the different groups develop in these um, plant tissues. So we have um, that bacteria that um, develops an infection thread and then uh, develops these nodules and within these nodules is where the magic starts with the nitrogen fixation. So just to give an example of why this is important of, and also to have this sense that nowadays that we're living in times where technology allows us to understand this better and from that understanding, being able to improve our systems and to uh, make these management decisions that allows us to take extra, ste ex extra steps in um, the agricultural systems. So some takeaways from this part in the projects, uh, project is that plants and microbes interact in the soil in different ways, which uh, could impact plant productivity, stress tolerance, and disease resistance. And we expect that plant material coming from cover crops will increase microbial biomass and diversity or community composition, and that this uh, response will also benefit symbiotic microbial groups and plant growth. So that would be my part, and I'll hand it over to Zach. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining the Grossman Lab. I see. Uh... I see Julie here. Um, if you want to say a few words, Julie, uh, totally up to you. I know you're a little busy this morning too. Um, then we might also have, uh, I don't, oh, hey, there she is. Hey, Zach, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? I didn't put you on the I'm spot in. today. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm actually at the doctor with my son. So yeah, well, welcome everybody. I'm glad that um, the group could be here today to, to present to you on our project. Um, as was said in the beginning, we're really, really honored to be working with the tribe and with Zach and the Rockstar team up there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always um, amazed when I hear the graduate students speak on their different areas of expertise. But as you can see, this project has a lot of benefits that um, are both research and practical um, in their, their, their outcomes and outputs. And what's really important to us is that we hear from those that are gonna benefit from the work. And so maybe for the rest of the call, I know there's not that much time left, but it would be really wonderful to hear what questions people have, um, the areas that we feel like might be the most interesting for us to dig a little bit deeper into and try to get a sense of what's useful, what's valuable, um, and where we could be answering our or answering the questions you have better. And so if I could um, could get some feedback on that, or if we could as a group get some feedback on that, that would just be awesome because um, that's that's why we do the work we do is to be able to to both advance research but also bring some of this information to everybody else. So um, yeah, thanks for letting us present today. And I'm sorry I have to sit here in my mask and my hat, but. You know, that's the way life goes sometimes. <laughs> no, thank you. I just, uh, thanks, Julie. I put the uh, the link in for the Grossman Lab so you can check out all these great scientists are from working with Julie. Hey, was that Noreen? Yeah. Yes, I do. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Oh. Did you want to share a cover crop question or story or what you're up to? Yeah, so um, we have been using summer cover crops and we're um, also doing some multi-species ones around the perimeter of a field. And so the microbes in the multi-species are quite different 
uh, Haver from the U of M was actually doing it versus the middle of the field. Um, so it's just kind of a fun, but actually I think as a farmer, I'd like to ask too, is there any sense of yield? You know, cause farmers of course, bottom line, but um, we're improving soil health, but also what is the yield difference in some of the use of cover crops and, you know, from not using cover crops? Yeah, and we're gonna be monitoring the yields on um, both the broccoli that comes after the cover crop that's in its own season. And then also because these plots are gonna be in place for two to three years at the sites monitoring the yield on the lettuce that comes in the spring after fall cover crops. Cause yeah, that's, um, you know, that's often the big question, a big question. Cause as much as cover crops can contribute to soil fertility and sort of the long-term health of the soil, it does sometimes happen that you put down a cover crop and the decomposition, the microbes in the process of decomposing that cover crop, especially if it's a high carbon material, um, can sort of tie up the nitrogen. And so it's not unheard of for, it, for a cover crop to, to interfere with yield in the crop after it. So, so that's part of what we're keeping an eye on here. And it's also part of why we're monitoring the, um, the soil nitrate like Maddie talked about on a monthly basis so that we can we can see how that timing is working out and whether that whether the the release of the cover crop nitrogen is in sync with when the when the um, the cash the vegetable crop is going to need it to to support its yield. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great point about the nitrogen. Adrian, oh, I'm sorry, Noreen. Can you hear me? Oh, you go ahead, Julie. Goodness. Okay. Yeah, just one more, you know, one more thing to take into consideration with the nitrogen um, contribution uh, or, or, or modification of nitrogen in the soil due to cover crops. There's also um, a consideration of moisture because if you have a cover crop right before a cash crop and you're in a very dry year, then that cover crop can actually remove enough soil moisture to impact the next crop. And so that I was in North Carolina for a number of years and that was a real concern down there. We didn't have a lot of soil moisture or just moisture in general, but up here it's a little less, less concerning, but if it's a really dry year, you'll wanna um, you know, really monitor the soil moisture and make sure that that, um, that cover crop isn't removing soil moisture prior to planting of a cash crop that needs the moisture to be there. So just something to think about in addition to Adria's. Yeah, also just to plug in, but uh, in, in our research, it's still like early to determine how, how yield is performing, but we are we do have a, a high tunnel project and it's been going on for a couple of years and they also have like a cover crop, um, main crop rotation. And I, about two years ago, I've I, we had the biggest peppers I've ever seen in my life and it was only with cover crops. So, Give it, give it some time and you can definitely see some benefits. So you planted cover crops in the high tunnel. What, what did you plant? That's another project, but um, they were planting cowpea and sorghum sudan grass in that, in that high tunnel, at least yeah. one of the years. And then you maybe mimicked uh, uh, like a strip till, like you just made a line cut through it and then planted right in the, in the, in the um, it's it's divided yeah. by, by like square plots, but that's that's the, the idea behind the yeah making probably like a whole strip of it um, when you're gonna plant your 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 cover crops. Okay, I like that. Uh, idea. David, I'd be happy to talk to you about the cover cropping. The high tunnel works at some point. Um, we've got a lot of cool stuff going on in high tunnels with a variety of cover crops and the sorghum sudan grass and the cowpea is one, but we're also looking at that should rye. Um, we have a little bit of data from uh, Austrian winter pea. So we have a whole bunch of stuff we're, we're playing with um, in the high tunnels to see how they might um, modify a number of the same things we're talking about in the summer cover cropping project. Um, so we're really just interested in the impact of those crops on soils and, and insects and fertility. And I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that you'll be up here on Tuesday, Julie, um, with- uh, 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 Yeah. Yeah, with uh, my with, friend over with here. With Wendy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yep, yep. We're gonna be coming up on Sunday, and then we'll be at the um, at Red Lake Nation College probably on Tuesday morning. Okay. Yeah. So um, we could chat in person, maybe. I think. Yeah, I'm. I'm really thinking we need to renew our 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 our, our partnership kind of a thing. You know, I know we we did get together with <clears throat> Vivian Waters, but we weren't quite ready yet, and we have a little bit more staff and we have a lot better understanding of how soil works or doesn't work and um yeah we i i i'm thinking we need to talk to all of you that would be great david i look forward to that i had another quick uh thing to noreen's and then i'll follow it up with a question uh david's question about the termination but um I guess my opinion is like, um, I feel like uh, it has that potential to, without any data or any research, it definitely has a potential, like Naomi was saying, uh, to increase yields. I guess where I'm, where I think about about it in a farmer perspective is that um, it's increasing soil infiltration. Like that's where, and that's where my mind goes when I think of cover, uh, cover crop. So. If my soil can retain more moisture overall, like in it, there's more organic matter in feeding the microbes, then long term, you're not putting in as many inputs because you, and then you have that water there. So that's kind of how I think of it is like if it's keeping the water in the soil more, you're feeding the microbes to give them the opportunity to feed your roots more nutrients. So it's like this if this then this then this then this i would feel like just from a scientific perspective it might be hard to say more cover crops more yields because there's so many ifs in between and there's so many factors but i think there's a more direct relationship between cover crops and soil health with providing more organic matter which provides more micro uh, microbes so that's more of a direct line i think and then from there you can make that uh do that other experiment of like how that increases yields on uh certain crops that might be growing i don't know that's my own two two cents and maybe like the the line of from a farm perspective but um yeah in terms of termination i wonder like i guess i'm putting it out there like what methods might be used i'm wondering like is there like a crimping machine that's like smaller like does that exist like a smaller like i know they've got these bcs tillers now for smaller farms and gardeners is there like a small crimping machine you could go down an aisle and like yeah some rye or oats or something you know i've seen some um some crimpers where they're it's manual where you like step on a board that has the crimper blades on the bottom but if we think about why we use a crimper um there i used to work a lot with this device for those of you that don't know a roller crimper is a big water-filled drum that rolls over a cover crop and kills it and creates and instead of chopping it up it creates like a big flat mulch over the soil surface and the main reason we do it is so that we don't have to till because we know that tillage can really modify in a negative way modify soil structure over time so you know, not tilling is a benefit. Killing a cover crop without having to like disturb the soil is a real benefit. But the problem in, North, in Minnesota with the crimper is that we, if we're trying to control weeds through that mulch, so if we're flattening it out with the crimper in order to create a really thick surface mulch, um, which is mostly why people do it, so they don't have to cultivate till little weeds later, creating that mulch without a lot of biomass to control weeds doesn't work. And so if we can't grow a really great stand of cover crop, um, my opinion is that it's it's probably not that beneficial to crimp it because the weeds are just going to pop right through and we're going to have to till in the vegetable systems to get rid of them anyway. So it's yeah, you got to think about why I think we may want to crimp um, in the first place. But to your question, um, I don't, I don't know if there's anything for the BCS. I haven't seen one that it might be out there. They're coming out with new things all the time. We, we have, have a flail mower attachment that we stick on the front. I think we have a, an attachment. Not a crimp. No. Oh, 
I thought I not a crimper. No, he, he's talking about like a, something that just flattens it out and bends the stem um, to kill the crop. The other thing about a crimper is it has to be the plant has to be really mature, like almost flowering, to be able to to kill it. Otherwise, we've had we had situations in North Carolina where when I was based before that we'd crimp the cover crop and it would still it, we'd we'd come back the next day and it would just be popped right back up, <laughs> kind of laughing at us. Um, it didn't kill it. So it has to be pretty much um, pretty mature to be able to kill it with a crimper. But we do have a Naomi. You're right that we do have a flail mower. We have that thing we put on the front of a walk behind tractor that chops it up into little tiny pieces, and that's a great way to kill it. But they're also very expensive, so that's a trade off. I was thinking that mowing, you know, is is another form of termination. And I, you know, with these oats, you know, the question was also over here is, well, can't we harvest it for um, straw and sell it because you know there's an economic component to what we're doing here and i also realize that you know we need to invest this invest in the soil today so maybe not bailing it up would be the best thing but rather mowing it and leaving it for biomass would be the next best best thing especially if you have a hard time getting a hold of a crimper Yep, I, I would agree. I think like Adria mentioned, anytime we take anything off of that system, whether it's a crop or we're taking off the cover crop material, we're taking away the nutrients and the organic, like the potential for that soil to build organic matter. But it depends what your goal is, right? If you want to eat it, you know, like Zach mentioned some some edible options, that's that's a that's a choice. Um but it depends why we're using that that cover crop in the first place. There are a lot of different reasons we we use them. So if you you know want to make some money off the straw, then go for it. Yeah. So basically, the really the only two options for for terminating cover crops in um, in an organic system would be either mowing or crimping. Yeah, yeah. I've seen in really small scale systems. Oh, sorry, Adria. I was going to say, I've seen people go in with like um, shears, like just clippers. And if you have a really small plot, you can just clip it down and let it sit on the surface. But it might take a while to decompose. All right, go ahead, Adria. Yeah, and like Zach showed the one farm doing it with the sty. The cover crops that we're using, because we have one of our, our growth periods is this late growth after the lettuce. Everything that we're using will winter kill. Um, so in that case, we don't have to figure out how to kill it. We just have to eventually incorporate that biomass. But that's another way to help. You know, they don't necessarily have to provide to survive the winter to provide some winter protection to the soil. Um, so we don't in this systems like we don't do any fall tillage. We leave that biomass on the surface, and then and then it's usually a little easier to incorporate in the winter once it's gone through that period. Although, you know, a certain amount of the biomass is, is lost when it decomposes on the surface like that. But, um, but yeah, so you, you can just, you can let the cold kill it if it's in the right, if it's the right species at the right time, but then you still have to, to get it into the soil or to get the crop into that, into what's remaining of the biomass. And one more question for Zach. Um, you talked about disking the hairy vetch um, before they planted pumpkins. Now, is disking, is that in conflict, conflict with a, a no-till system? Um, I think that's, uh, I guess if it's just disking, I would say that's, that would be keeping with no-till because you're not tilling it. So that would be like our conservation till or less, you know, less destructive. Um, and I wonder too, yeah. I wonder if Josh just disked it and then like planted like in between the dying vetch plants or- Right. Maybe yeah, because I know it, he could- Maybe he tilled it after he disked it. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm just you know thinking about that, and and I don't I don't know if there's a cedar for pumpkins. Is there is there a no-till cedar for pumpkins? My guess with Josh, because they're such a small farm, is that they definitely hand planted those seeds. Okay. Um, so so he probably disked it and then maybe tilled it in. But my assumption is that he probably just disked it and then planted. 
into the in between the plants i guess uh, okay that would be my guess just based on knowing him and his operation a little bit okay thank you zach yeah any other questions <laughs> i have a question so hopefully you can hear me sorry i'm in the track <laughs> um so i'm just starting out with cover crops myself on a large scale and i don't know if i'm going to say this question exactly it but i want to obviously my goal is improve my soil health microbiome etc how does a person starting out um, how long realistically to get from point A to point B does it take with using cover crops? Like to start seeing a benefit? Yes. So um, one of my goals is to like wheat suppression and in um, one of my fields, I don't have a lot of microbial activity. So I want to increase that as well. And so um, I guess I want to know, besides wheat soil tests, which I do already, what other factors can they look for? What, you know, throughout the growing season. So I don't have to, I, I want to minimize my amount of time I'm in the field and the amount of inputs that I have. Did you catch the end of that, Adria? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. okay. I didn't hear. Do you want to start or? No. <laughs> you can. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Cool. Um. So I think I mean it sort of depends on where your system's starting from. Um. It sounds like you're working in more of like a field crop or a row crop system rather than a vegetable system. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. So I think it depends, you know, something like, uh, you know, people can use, you know, with a legume cover crop, you can put down a lot of nitrogen as soon as you put in that, that first crop. And so often, you know, if you put a big, um, you know, if you, if you get a nice stand of vetch on there, that's going to put down a lot of organic matter and quite a bit of nitrogen right away, which you might be seeing, I mean, you might be able to see the effect of that fertility right away. Um, but sometimes, you know, because some of the things that affect the short term impacts of the cover crop and how it's going to decompose, some of those are really out of our hands, like when's it going to rain, <laughs> you know? And so it's not always completely predictable uh, when those longer term benefits start to, to build up and whether you're going to you know, exactly when you're gonna see the shorter term benefits, like exactly when that particular vetch crop is gonna release its nitrogen. I don't know, Julie, what do, um, what would you say on that? No, I would totally agree, Adria. And I think it, there are some things that we can measure over the short term and some things that we can measure over the long term too with regards to soils. Like um, if we have active organic matter, it, can, you can measure that using specialized lab techniques um, and you can, you can measure a pretty quick change over time. Um, you know, maybe within a year, it takes, um, you know, five to seven years to see a change overall. So it really, it depends what we're talking about, what you're measuring, but you can see noticeable measure, benefits within a year or two. And I'm gonna have to hang up now. Um, but uh, thanks everybody for, for giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, I think. Um, I, um, I just wanted to add that she was talking about the weed suppression. Weed suppression is something that um, is very dependent on the species that you uh, select. So if you are really looking for weed suppression, just aiming for having um, a very aggressive growth uh, species. So in this case, we work with uh, buckwheat. Buckwheat um, is pretty good uh, with the weeds and it grows in about 30 some to 40 some days. So it has a pretty um, fast um, 
emergence um, relative to other species. So in that case, it, it's basically uh, just the species that you select to, to see that service. You know, I also think, you know, I mean, when we're talking about seeing benefits of cover crops, um, I'm thinking the main benefit of having a cover crop on is, is for soil retention, you know, or as opposed to erosion. I mean, that dust storm that came through the other day, you know, was um, ample evidence for me to say we need a cover crop. Are you doing any work on like under sowing of cover crops in cash crops, like something to put under tomatoes and under squash to reduce weeds and not decrease yields? I've done it. I did it one time with um, corn and I grew uh, red clover underneath and it worked out really well. It was, I did it. It's just, I guess it's just all about timing too. Uh, but I think I did it around flowering time, like July, but it was like perfect. It was like, I did do a very light tail, but then I just broadcasted it. And then that extra nitrogen or just, it just covered the ground perfectly. So I guess it's about timing and species and a lot of factors, but yeah, has anybody else experimented with that? Je um, Jessica Green Deer over there at the, uh... Wherever she works, she's she did that last year. She was planting in a in a living mulch. I forget what it was. I think it was a clover. You remember Jessica Green Deer, Zach? I forget. It's a Dream of Wild Health Farm. Oh yeah. I yes. Just, oh, go ahead, Adrian. Go ahead, okay. I, there's. I, we're not working with any um cover crop mulches, um, like living mulches, um, sometimes they're referred to in our study, but I think there is information on that, um, on the extension site that I shared in the chat. Um, yeah. so if you want to go check that out um, for more information, we definitely don't have um, any of that happening in our project, but there okay. are people doing research on that as well, so <laughs> just not us. Last, I think last question, then we're going to head out. Um, good question on, can a cover crop help decrease thick grass or quack grass or like uh, if you have really thick grass and it keeps coming back on the edges or in your field, is there any cover crop recommendation that can help break that up a little bit or maybe just constant cover cropping? Adria is our weed expert. <laughs> Yeah, I'm unfortunately not a quackgrass expert, although I think there are recommendations on that. But I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> to tackle a sort of an aggressive spreading weed, it kind of needs, you need something that's going to grow in aggressively. Um, and I wish I could rattle off what's, what's good for that. Maybe Zach, you have a better idea. Um, I have been, I, I had never worked with Phacelia before, but I was really impressed with the way the Phacelia really filled in like a really dense stand. Um, and that seemed very promising for sort of smothering things, but I don't know for sure how that would, you know, how that would tolerate a, you know, a mat of quack grass trying to compete with it either. So. Yeah, I think. Um... Just doing, um doing your own demo projects in your farm, having like this really small plot where you don't have to do much, just observe and, and see what, like we were saying, it's really dependent on, on your soils, on a lot of attributes from your personal experiences. So having, having that done in your, on your own way will help uh, determine those things. Yeah, let's leave it, let's leave it at that. Like all, we're all scientists, we're all learning and that's a good way to to learn is like every time I do anything that's a big change on the farm, just do it this way over here and do it this way over here and which one worked better. And uh, I think maybe one idea with the grass, I, I think uh, I've used is also like the, uh, the radish stuff, the daikon, because maybe if that establishes well, that's breaking through the grass. So if you have that going, but 
maybe try a spot of radish, a spot of this, a spot of that, and then try them all in one spot. So, and see which one kind of works best on your, your farm. Yeah, and to some extent, I think a cover crop is sort of a second order um, help with something like quack grass, where a lot of the recommendation has to do with hitting it frequency, frequently with tillage. And yeah, that, yeah. that can be tough. And so a cover crop is sort of a way to, even if the cover crop isn't directly affecting the quack grass, it can be a way to sort of rebuild what you're having to, uh, what you might be burning off by having to use a lot of intense tillage. Yeah, and in the beginning, it might just be easier to either till or just put some kind of tarp over it for a while just to get that initial uh, get rhizomes dying and then from there just start cover cropping as much as you can. Well, thanks everyone. If you want to leave uh, me a note, uh, I've got my email in there about the and we could send you a flyer for the field day. And if Julie's coming up to Red Lake, maybe she could stop at White Earth if she wants. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're up in Monoman, and most of you are down in Minneapolis. There's a big river farm, so there's plenty of opportunities to, oh, there's someone joining us right now. Well, Eldon, uh, we did record the session, so if you want to send me an email, I could send you, but we're just wrapping up right now, so sorry. But um, thanks everyone. Well, thanks so much for organizing this sec. Yeah, and we'll get it. I think I'll put it up on the White Earth Mobile Market website too. It was a really good discussion and about the project and everything. So we'll get it up somewhere too. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. See you later. Yeah, stay warm. It's going to be 30 something today.